silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Except perhaps in Bethlehem, where Christians and other Palestinians who live there continue to be penned in behind a 30-foot-high concrete wall, unable to travel even the short distance to Jerusalem, probably about five miles away. Thus, I have probably been to that holy city more than most of them who live in its very shadow. Nor is it very calm in Aleppo, where Christians, among other residents, are hunkering down or fleeing for their lives in the midst of a horrendously violent and destructive war. And it isn't too bright in Egypt, where Coptics going to Mass this Christmas will do so in mourning and fear in the aftermath of a church bombing which took the lives of 25 congregants not less than two weeks ago. And it won't even be calm in Rome, where those attending the services at the Vatican will do so only after submitting to a much more thorough security screening under the cloud of an escalated threat by ISIS to destroy this symbolic center of our Christian world and its pontiff, who, in spite of the threat, bravely refuses to curb his access to the public and the faithful, and continues to preach a gospel of mercy and love in the face of hatred. And we know it isn't too bright in Berlin, a city stunned by the loss of a dozen people and the injuries of many more in those recent attacks on the Christmas market. And in Mexico, where many were killed in a fireworks factory blast. And it's not all that calm here in the United States, where there will be many empty places at holiday tables vacated by loved ones lost to gun violence, or drug overdoses during this past year. And it's certainly not bright, even right here in our own corner of Cape Cod, as parents, family, and friends mourn the loss of yet two more young people whose lives were so suddenly cut short in a terrible accident. Indeed, this Christmas, And every Christmas brings a very real challenge to us as followers of Jesus Christ. Will we try to face Christmas in some sort of picture-perfect Courier and Ives myth that's promoted by our culture, or in a merriment that's mindlessly suggested to us by merchants, who would like us to believe that if we have this or that product, we will finally have the joy, the fulfillment that we long for. But to be really merry and bright, wouldn't we have to shut off CNN and hide the newspaper? Or better yet, can we take the authentically religious approach to Christmas by daring to look at it and the world squarely in the eye at the same time? If so, then we have to start by admitting the truth that our world is in a mess. And on second thought, to realize that it probably has always been in a mess to some degree or another. It certainly was so in the days when that Christ child came to birth in the humblest of circumstances with a murderous tyrant, Herod, ruling nearby in Jerusalem. 
and the peace of Rome maintained throughout a large empire, not by people living moral lives, but by military might. Yet let us appreciate anew that it is when we accept reality rather than deny it that we can find the real message and meaning of Christmas. Not merely a sentimental remembrance of a miraculous birth and a divine babyhood, because such a superficial celebration is lost on a vast many suffering people. No, Christmas is not limited to that brief moment of Christ's existence, but rather spans all of his life, from his birth to his baptism at about age 30, in order to point to realities about him beyond that. Thus, the very heart of Christmas is about the incarnation, about God taking on our human flesh, our human existence, not in spite of the mess of a world full of injustice and violence and fear, but precisely because of it. Indeed, God so loved the world, inhabited by fallen humanity, that he would send his only son to save it. And to save it not by taking it by force to make it right again, but by sharing it completely and thus redeeming it gently but powerfully, but not yet fully and finally, as we have been reminded throughout the season of Advent. By the great mystery of the Incarnation, this child whose birth in Bethlehem we remember today would experience everything that we must experience, even to the point where he himself would fall victim to the injustice and violence that so dominate this realm run by flawed humanity. Yet he would raise this fallen world and all its inhabitants with himself to the heights of heaven, and in doing so, bequeath a durable hope to all who believe in him and to trust in his promise. So this feast belongs to all of us, but its message is meant especially for all who are suffering injustice or living in want or sorrow or fear. Its message is simple but profound. You are not alone. No one is ever alone. If because at the moment our lives are calm and bright, secure and flush, we can celebrate Christmas in merely in a manner in which those who are suffering or in sorrow would probably feel excluded from, then we have missed the point of Christmas entirely. Rather, as God became one with us in the Incarnation, we are called to become one with one another. Indeed, to be in solidarity with all of humanity, but especially with those who suffer, reminding them of the good news, indeed the best news ever, that God has become one with us in Christ, so that we might be one in Christ with God forever. When we know this and live this, then we can sing Silent Night or any other carol with conviction and integrity, assured that even in the face of much that should still disturb us in this world, there is a reason to remain calm even in the face 
of all the trouble of this world and in the face of its darkness there is always a light that is shining because Christ Emmanuel God ever with us and among us is the reason for serenity in the face of this world's turmoil and the true light that no darkness can ever overcome. In that good news, let us find an abiding peace at Christmas and always, and without any hesitation, tell that good news and share that peace with others.